growing green to generate more green. Welcome to The Grow Show with Kyle Cushman. Each week we plant the conversational seeds about cultivation and the changing climate of cannabis culture. We'll peel back the layers of benefits of the world's most versatile plant, from food to fuel, from remedy to resource. CannabisRadio.com proudly presents The Grow Show with your host, multi-award winning grow master and respected cannabis consultant, Kyle Cushman. Hello to all you groovy growers, happy hamsters, chillax and chill and tokers. This is Kyle Cushman and you're listening to The Grow Show. Today's show is about marijuana legalization and the future of cannabis culture. What happens when weed is normal? Today's guest is Keith Strop, an old friend of mine, founder of Normal and Legal Counsel. Keith, how are you doing today? I'm doing fine, Kyle. Nice to be with you. Oh, thanks so much for being here. You know... You've been at the forefront of cannabis policy and legalization, and one of my all-time favorite topics, normalization of cannabis use for decades. And when we first met, you were a much younger man running a, <laughs> running a I don't know if struggling is the right word, tumultuous normal, and I was a fledgling High Times cultivation reporter with big wide eyes thinking how great it was to be in the presence of all you important people. And all I knew on my mind was I wanted to help legalize, normalize, and just bring cannabis use into a normal part of our culture. And so when I met you guys, I was really a little bit starstruck, I got to say. Well, it was very kind of you. I think it really had to do with we were a little older than you or a good bit older than you, Kyle. And as a result, you know, if you've been around longer, I understand when you first start, you tend to look up at those people who've been doing it longer. Incidentally, when we started Normal in 1970, we were not the first group by any means to work on legalization. LIMAR, that had been started by Allen Ginsberg and a few other people, Michael Aldrich in New York was the first, and it uh, sort of changed into a group called Amorphia, if you remember Amorphia, that sold Acapulco gold rolling papers made out of hemp. And they, in turn, in 72, merged with Normal and became our West Coast office. I felt the same that's, way. Th- some of the folks that were really involved before me were my heroes. <laughs> I, I didn't know anything about that. And so how did you come up with the acronym Normal, and how did Normal get its start? Well, it had to do, for one thing, I have to give some credit to the anti-war movement, the Vietnam War movement. I was coming of age coming out of college at the height of the Vietnam War, and most of us did not want to go to that war if you were of draft age, and we were looking for ways to avoid it, and one way was you stayed in school as long as you could. So I went to law school. I ended up going to Georgetown Law School, but I got out of law school, and I was still uh, 27 years old, and you were eligible to be drafted until you were 29. So I ended up getting what was called a critical skills deferment with the help of the National Lawyers Guild. The National Lawyers Guild has always been a a group of great lawyers, lefty lawyers, and they actually offered me a chance if if, uh, uh, they would put me in touch with some psychiatrist in Baltimore who would say I was gay, and back then, uh, if you were gay, they didn't want you in the Army. Um, I, thought that, I thought that was a fairly good idea, but I was married at the time with a young daughter, and my wife just wouldn't hear about it. They also offered to put me in touch with some people in Canada if I wanted to leave the country. But again, you, you weren't sure you would ever be allowed back in the country. As it turns out, Jimmy Carter did, in fact, fairly early on, allow draft dodgers had gone to Canada to, to come back into the country. So anyway, I ended up with the help of the National Lawyers Guild uh, getting what was called a critical skills deferment, which was a deferment that local draft boards had the authority to issue if they felt the job you were doing domestically was important enough, then rather than go fight a war, you could spend your two years here domestically. So I, I was working for the National Commission on Product Safety, and it was a group that had been created by Congress, but it was the result of Ralph Nader's work, consumer advocate Ralph Nader. And uh, during those two years, I really was introduced to the concept of public interest law, that is using your legal skills and legal degree to try to impact public policy 
rather than trying to help a particular client or get rich or whatever. By the time that commission ended, I was 29, I was too old to be drafted, and I was just thrilled with this new concept of public interest law, but it wasn't product safety that really interested me. I had first smoked marijuana when I was a freshman at Georgetown Law School. I wanted to apply the public interest model to establish a marijuana smokers lobby, and that's that's what normal came out of, that background. Well, I want to wish you a personal thank you for not going to war and starting normal. <laughs> I fully acknowledge that there are a lot of players in the movement that have helped bring us to where we are now, but Normal is certainly a big player in that. And so just a personal thank you from everybody out here for all the time well, you've put uh, in. I, I appreciate it. I, I think if I were to grade our paper, I would say probably the most important single thing Normal did was we took the position that there's absolutely nothing wrong with the responsible use of marijuana by adults. There were other people calling for some sort of drug law reform, but they always talked about marijuana smokers in the third person. That is, they would talk about those people who smoke marijuana. Normal from the very beginning just came right out front and said, those of us who smoke marijuana. So I think what we did was we, we... we gave a friendly face to uh, the marijuana smoker that a lot of Americans had never seen before. And that's absolutely what drew me to the organization was that mentality and the fact that I had always felt normal about it. And, and I very soon adopted the phrase normalization of cannabis and cannabis use. And that's been very important to me all these years. What do you think is the single biggest factor that will lead to the inevitable decriminalization of marijuana and marijuana users? Well, I think, in fact, the demographics of the issue assure that we are winning it, period. In other words, we're, I think we're past the tipping point. I really do not believe there's any serious risk that the country would change direction at this point. We knew, oh, at least a decade ago, we could see from the polling that uh, younger Americans favored legalization. Uh, some of them smoked, but some of them didn't, but they had friends who smoked or they had family members. It was just no big deal to them whether someone smoked marijuana or not. Our opponents were people my age and older, people who had lived through the reefer madness mentality. And it was awfully hard for those folks to reevaluate marijuana and marijuana policy. So we knew eventually, as the older Americans retired and stepped aside and were replaced by younger Americans, we would, we would eventually win this issue. I'll be honest, I wasn't quite sure I would live long enough to see it, <laughs> and I'm <laughs> delighted that I have. And, of course, once change begins, it tends to speed up then. You know, you make only, only marginal progress for year after year after year, but then all of a sudden things fall into place. And I think about five years ago that happened. I guess probably 2012 was the big step when Colorado and Washington finally legalized marijuana. And, of course, since then we've added Oregon and Alaska and the District of Columbia, and we're probably going to add four or five more states in 2016. So interesting that we're winning this issue even though only 14 percent of the american public smoke marijuana 86 percent of the public are not marijuana smokers so the reason we're winning is that after all of these years we have finally won the hearts and minds of a majority of the american public they're not pro pot but they now conclude and agree that prohibition causes more harm to the country than the drug it's trying to prohibit. So uh, it's a right. fragile coalition that we have. We have to be sensitive to the fact that as we move forward, be careful. We've got to conduct ourselves in a responsible manner. We have to minimize the unintended consequences that might result in some states from legalization. But so long as we do that, the majority of the American public are with us, even though they're not smokers. Absolutely. There's a question on my mind that I, that I debate a lot in, in my circle and with my peers, and I'm, I'm interested what your opinion on, on it is. Uh, why should or why shouldn't the president use a presidential order to legalize, decriminalize, or even reclassify cannabis before leaving office? Well, first off, 
I wouldn't be surprised at all. In fact, I, I anticipate that before Obama's uh, term is ended, he will likely use his administrative powers to reschedule marijuana, to lower it at least to Schedule 3, uh, where marijuana currently exists. Uh, and he can do that administratively. Now, keep in mind, he actually does not have the power to either decriminalize or legalize marijuana unilaterally. He would have to have the support of a majority of Congress to do that. And currently, with the, the makeup of Congress, we just don't have the support to do it. We have more support this year than we had last, and we'll have more in the coming years. But I think we're probably still at least five years away from having sufficient support in Congress to change federal law and get the feds out of the way. So the focus, I think, needs to continue to be on the state level. We're getting of real. Course. This is a really great discussion, and this is why I had you here. I'm having a really good time listening to this, this topic of discussion. We're going to take a quick break for our sponsors, and then we're going to come right back and talk more with Keith Strop, the founder of Normal. The Grow Show with Kyle Cushman will return once we cultivate through this short commercial break. Gondrepreneur.com, your guide to the cannabis business world. Gondrepreneur.com is a comprehensive resource for cannabis professionals and entrepreneurs. Download the Gondrepreneur app on your smartphone or tablet to catch up on cannabis industry news, scroll through our daily job listings, and learn about successful cannabis companies, executives, and investors. Gondrepreneur.com, helping Gondrepreneurs grow. Great websites today need expert web design and development and need to be e-commerce ready and mobile friendly. But building a marketable and profitable website can be an uphill climb. Ready to make your new website or replace your existing website? Think Orange as the new way to get in the black. Orange Hill Development works with Fortune 500 companies and offer the same top quality development service at a fraction of what other providers charge. Brands like Absolute, Carlsberg, and Nestle trust Orange Hill Development. Find out why you should trust your website with Orange Hill. Contact Orange Hill for a consultation today at orangehilldevelopment.com. The smoke is rising, and the next crop of podcasts devoted to cannabis providers and enthusiasts are ready to be harvested. Welcome to the Cannabis Radio Network, founded by respected rainmakers who have been producing award-winning podcasts for over a decade. Industry headlines, business updates, medical reports, marketing, and e-commerce education rolled up perfectly for your consumption. Let's grow together. The Cannabis Radio Network. CannabisRadio.com. Time to plant some more conversational seeds. You're listening to The Grow Show with Kyle Cushman, only on CannabisRadio.com. Hello, everybody, and welcome back. I am Kyle Cushman, your host for The Grow Show. I'm talking with Keith Strop, the founder of the Normal Organization, the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws, and they have been... Uh, ever present in this struggle for legalization of cannabis. And as we broke there, Keith, you were saying something about um, President Obama uh, adding something to this, this debate or this fight. When Obama was first elected, there were a lot of marijuana smokers who had very high expectations of what he might do to move us towards marijuana legalization during his first term. And they were disappointed because, frankly, the first several times the issue arose, it arose with uh, people signing petitions on the White House website and things like that. Whenever the president was asked about marijuana or marijuana legalization, he made a joke about it. He laughed about it. In fact, the first time I think he, he said something like, uh, I wonder what those folks have been smoking. Ha, ha, ha. Well, the reality is, uh, Obama said in, in his own book, when he was a senator and wrote his first biography, he was a, a regular marijuana smoker all during high school and during his early college years as well. And uh, some biographies that have been written about him even go deeper into that. I think he was, uh, he was quite a, a dedicated smoker. We might call him a stoner with today's language. But... Uh, I've been in Washington long enough that I realize most presidents during their first term uh, don't spend much time on controversial social issues. They, they don't have much to gain from it, and it may hurt them in their reelection campaign. But what Obama Certainly. has done in his second term is really uh, uh, enormously important to the legalization movement. When 
Oregon, uh, I'm sorry, when Colorado and Washington first voted by, uh, by voter initiative in 2012 to legalize marijuana, it obviously put them in conflict with federal law. And if the president would have wanted, and most prior presidents would have, they could have simply asked the Department of Justice to go into federal court and to seek an injunction to stop the implementation of those state laws. Now, keep in mind, no state has a legal obligation to mimic federal law. So, for example, a state can remove marijuana penalties altogether, and there's nothing the federal government could do to force them to reenact marijuana laws. Where the trouble comes into is what the Supreme Court calls a positive conflict. And where the federal law says it's a crime to sell or grow marijuana, and where the state is now licensing marijuana growers and sellers, most legal observers think that would be a positive conflict. And if Obama would have wanted, he could have probably stopped the implementation of the provisions in those first states that license growers and sellers. Now, what he so elected that, to that's do, a very that is a very important point that people don't 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 ra- rarely ever talk about. Well, I think they may not realize, but until we actually had a couple of states with legalization where we could measure the impact and we could quantify the success, it was largely an intellectual argument. Our side was saying this will be a better uh, program for everybody. The other side was saying the sky will fall if you legalize marijuana, but it was an intellectual argument. Because Obama held the Department of Justice back, they issued a series of memoranda called the Cole Memos, uh, named after Deputy Attorney General Jack Cole, in which they outlined seven or eight criteria. But essentially they said, if the states will make a good faith effort to minimize drug use by minors and to minimize the uh, sale of marijuana to other states where it's still illegal, then the federal government was willing to allow those states to experiment with marijuana legalization, and let's see how it works. That is an incredible gift that Obama gave us, and he essentially gave us the last four years of his, well, his second term, to build a track record so that we can demonstrate that legalization actually works and works well for everybody. So uh, I think we should all be in his debt. And again, uh, I wouldn't be at all surprised if he administratively reclassifies marijuana under federal law before he leaves office. And he does have the authority to do that. I absolutely agree. I think that he has definitely been on our side pretty much about as much as a president can be expected to do. Did you catch the joke at his correspondence dinner? I'm not, not going to rephrase it exactly perfect, but he said something to the effect of, um, he was talking about Bernie Sanders and saying, yeah, you know, Bernie Sanders is a great guy. I hear a lot of people are starting to talk about him. I guess people are interested in electing another liberal stoner. He said, another <laughs> liberal stoner. So he was, he was referring to himself as the first – oh, and another liberal stoner president was the term. Yeah. So he oh, must yeah. be the first liberal stoner president that we elected. <laughs> and I thought that self-deprecating humor was just fantastic. Well, and he was certainly the first president who didn't feel the need to apologize about his marijuana smoking. You know, everybody else either had right. Bill Clinton saying he didn't inhale, which was, of course, such an obvious lie that it, it, it lost credibility altogether. Or you had the others, the Bushes and others, who made a youthful indiscretion mistake, but of course they would never do it again today. For once, we sure. have a president who acknowledges he used a lot of marijuana in his younger days, and he doesn't apologize for it. Let's take this away from uh, the governmental discussion, which is great, and, and that's a big reason why I had you here, because you're so prolific and so up-to-date on these issues. Um, what do you think is the most important societal change that will take place as a direct result of the end of cannabis prohibition? Well, That's a big uh, question. Yeah, there, there, I think there are two things. I'm not sure which is the most important, but I, I think the most important is keep in mind that at the height of marijuana prohibition, say four or five years ago, we were arresting more than 850,000 Americans on marijuana charges every year, and between 89 and 90 percent of those were for simple possession of an ounce or less. They were just marijuana smokers. If they were students, they were no longer eligible for student loans. 
most people lost their jobs. They get a criminal record, and far too many of them actually went to jail, some for long periods of time. So the biggest change will be that we no longer waste that enormous amount of criminal justice resources chasing after harmless marijuana smokers who are hurting no one. Now, I will say that as we see the incredible economic benefits of legalization in states like Colorado and now in Washington, soon to be in Oregon and Alaska. When you hear Congressman Jared Polis, for example, from Boulder, Colorado, talk about their new law, I mean, he he talks about the fact that, of course, he likes that marijuana helps a lot of seriously ill patients and other things, but what he's really amazed by are the tens of thousands of new jobs that have been created in Colorado, and he talks about the young, rich entrepreneurs who've been lured with their money to start new companies in Colorado all because of what we kind of laughingly call the green rush. The fact that marijuana is now legal and there are incredible opportunities for people to get involved in this new industry. So I think in the longer run, it may well be that it's the economic side of things that ends up spreading legalization nationwide. So it's not just a handful of progressive states, but ultimately even Alabama and Mississippi and Oklahoma are going to realize that it's a lot better for them to create jobs than it is to lock up their own youth. I, I agree. The social, the social ramifications are huge and they're, they're overwhelmingly positive. It could cause a very positive change in not only our country, but I believe in, in society as a whole. Kyle, let me add one other thing, too, and I realize this may be a little uh, insider baseball, but I've always felt that not just that marijuana is not bad for you, but in the right setting, marijuana is actually good for you. For me individually, for example, if I'm doing any creative writing, I love to get stoned, lock myself in my office, and just write down every thought that comes in my mind. Sometimes when I read it the next morning, I laugh at myself because sometimes I was just stoned. But oftentimes <laughs> what I find out is I am being more thoughtful and insightful that I should have been able to, to reach without marijuana, but I wasn't. Somehow in the rush of the day and the problems we all face and the deadlines we have, sometimes you're just not very creative. So I think that once we have marijuana ingrained as an option to alcohol, there will be literally tens of millions of Americans who, instead of being aggressive and dull, they'll actually be spurred on to be creative. Yeah, and, and a little pacific. You know, there's no doubt about it. You ask any bartender. They're not worried about marijuana. Alcohol is what causes everybody to get angry and drunk and get into fights. When did you ever see a fight at a marijuana party? Never in my life. Hey, hey listen, we're, we're running really close to the end, and, and, I, and I have one more question that I've got to get just a quick answer from you, okay? Sure. We elected Ronald Reagan and Arnold Schwarzenegger to public office mainly because they were popular entertainers. You know, we saw Tommy Chong's popularity on Dancing with the Stars. He made it to the quarterfinals, you know, 74-year-old man. So I'm wondering, do you think a counterculture icon like Tommy Chong could ever get elected to public office? Yes, indeed I do. And I think in the you know, next several years, you will see examples of that. Our culture has its own heroes and its own stars. And just as no one took Ronald Reagan seriously when he first indicated he was going to run for governor of California, of course, we ended up taking him quite seriously because he also became president of the United States. I don't see any reason in the world why cultural icons from our subculture couldn't be equally as successful, but they'll have to obviously offer more than just the fact that they enjoy good marijuana, because that <laughs> won't be sufficient to get them elected. But yes, I think you'll see some out front committed marijuana smokers holding high office in the next five years. Oh, what a great answer, and what a great note to, uh, to end this segment on. It's been great talking with Keith Strop, and we're going to take our second break for our advertisers, and we'll be right back with Great Grows. The Grow Show with Kyle Cushman will return once we cultivate through this short commercial break. InternetMarketingNinjas.com is the online dojo of the highly trained and skilled Internet Marketing Ninjas. 
disavow documents, reconsideration requests, Panda and Penguin penalties. Let our superior SEO ninjas confront all of your link-related issues. The Internet Marketing Ninjas are equipped to master any marketing exercise, content creation, authorship, link building, PPC, and more. Plus, build more buzz for your brand with our social media marketing strategy. Discover all that the Internet Marketing Ninjas can do for you. Visit the online dojo now at internetmarketingninjas.com. Doc Rob, the concierge for better living. Cannabis is just one of the many great plants that we have on this planet called Earth that we can use consciously and intelligently to improve our well-being. Take a real, raw, inside look at healthier living while sharing great ideas and improvements for a better quality of life. Learning to live and live well is a lifelong process. This is a journey. It could be you could be 80 years old or 8 years old. You can still learn something that's going to make tomorrow a little bit healthier, a little bit easier, a little bit happier, a little bit better. The Concierge for Better Living with Doc Rob. Only on CannabisRadio.com. Ignite the conversation on some trending topics along the Cannabis Radio social media network. Join our crew of thousands on our Cannabis Radio page on Facebook or at Canna Radio, C-A-N-N-A Radio on Twitter. Plus, look for our Facebook and Google Plus pages for all of our original programs and connect with Dr. Dina, Kyle Cushman, Dr. Mitch Earlywine, Nurse Heather, Doc Rob, the hosts of Gondrepreneur, and more. Connect with the growing Cannabis Radio social crusade at Canna Radio on Twitter or search for Cannabis Radio on Facebook, Google Plus, and Instagram and grow with us. Time to plant some more conversational seeds. You're listening to The Grow Show with Kyle Cushman, only on CannabisRadio.com. Now it's time for the final segment of the show I like to call Great Grows. Each week I make sure to share some practical tips on what I've learned about cultivating the weed we all need. We've been getting great response from the segment Great Grows, and so I wanted to add an Ask Kyle section you can go to facebook.com slash the grow show and leave your questions for me and we'll be answering them on future segments. This week's topic is feminized seeds and why you should not breed with them. Keith, are you familiar with the term feminized seeds? I am not, Kyle. I'm fascinated to hear. Feminized seeds, uh, as you know, cannabis is a dioecious plant. That means that it can be either male or female. And Sensimilia is a Mexican word, which means seedless or without seeds. So we all like to utilize sensimilia marijuana, but that leaves out the whole breeding side of the equation. And of course, breeding is the wonderful thing that brings us so many new strains and so many new varieties with different properties that will aid in different ailments, maladies, and just certain conditions of the human condition. So breeding is a wonderful thing. Feminized seeds is a recent accomplishment that some breeders have perfected wherein they can use a substance called colchinine, which is derived from I want to say chrysanthemum flowers. I really apologize. I'm blanking out. It's a flower, either that or colloidal silver, and it is applied on a female plant. And what it does is it triggers a stress response in the plant, causing it to produce pollen as if it were a male. But since it's not a male, it produces pollen that has no male chromosomes in it. So it makes female seeds. So these female seeds are obvious. There's a lot of advantages to having seeds that aren't half boys and half girls. Now, if you live in a a small flat in London with a very low light allowance or uh, electricity allowance, and you know you can only grow four or five or six plants, it's really nice to know that if you buy some seeds from from a seed company of your favorite variety, that they're all going to be females, and that's going to be profitable and beneficial to your grow project. And I don't really have a problem with that. The problem is that people don't realize that if you decide to then breed with those feminized seeds, you are breeding an inferior strain. You're almost breeding a mongoloid strain because the whole male chromosome isn't present. So what you're doing is you're weakening the gene pool. So 
the reason I'm bringing this to the forefront is that I would like these breeders that make and sell these feminized seeds in very high quantities. In fact, some companies have told me that their seed sales are almost 50% feminized seeds. So the advantage to the breeder on that is that the people buying their seeds because they don't have the full genetic profile, they can't go home and better their genetics. So the breeder can be sure that his strain is not going to be bested by some amateur breeder. But on the other side, everybody who grows eventually likes to become a breeder. It's just a natural part of growing. You want to create your own variety. It's very simple. And so I just wish that the breeders of feminized seeds would put maybe not a warning, but maybe just a suggestion to their customers that they should not breed with these seeds. They are perfectly acceptable for producing really high quality marijuana and they do provide a big benefit in not having to cull half of the seeds away. But I really don't appreciate the fact that they're not advising people not to breed with these seeds. If you're a person who has decided that feminized seeds is a good fit for you and your garden, please, by all means, go ahead and utilize the benefit of feminized seeds, but don't use them to breed. Don't go and get a male from a friend or another breeder or another grower or create a male from some non-feminized seeds and think that you've got this great feminized strain and you really want to make it better, it's not going to happen. If you want to do any breeding, please use non-feminized females and then find yourself a quality male. Bring them together and you will have created something that the world has never seen before and hopefully that lights up your neurons and your cannabinoid receptors and makes you very happy and you can share it with all your friends. And that's my advice to novice breeders. Did that add? Uh, did that put anything into light for you, Keith? Yes, indeed. And in fact, I want to comment briefly that I appreciate enormously the talent of the, the marijuana growers in this country. The best marijuana in the world now is homegrown, and as you know, Kyle, that was not always the case. That's absolutely right. Homegrown American, and specifically, I don't want to alienate anybody, but I just do want to give props to California, my new home of ten years now. And the place that gave me a place to live for the first time as an adult without being a criminal, they really take cannabis serious here in this state. It's very generational. Generations of people have passed it down, father to son, father to daughter, mother to daughter and son. Some of the greatest cannabis in the world definitely comes from California. And indeed, America is a really great cannabis breeding country. All you people out there that are keeping the cannabis culture alive, I want to give you a big great and props, and I want to sign off now. We're running out of time. I want to thank Keith for coming here to be with us. Keith, do you have a website or an email that you'd like to share with the listeners? Sure. It's just go to the normal website, www.normal.org, and my email is keith at normal.org if anyone wants to be in touch. Thanks for all you, go- you growers do all across America. Great. Thanks for being on the show. And everybody, check out the Normal website and please support Normal or, or any of your cannabis legalization or movements in your local area. And once again, I want to thank everybody out there for listening. This is Kyle Cushman. This has been The Grow Show. And please, everybody, stay lifted. The opinions expressed on this CannabisRadio.com program are those of the guests and hosts and do not necessarily reflect those of the staff and management of CannabisRadio.com. Any rebroadcast or redistribution without proper consent of CannabisRadio.com is prohibited.